All right, so now you've all introduced yourself, uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm Jonathan Kim, I'm a senior at Newton North, um, and I did SYP for the second semester. Um, and I did it on existentialism challenged and conveyed through the literary form. So what this uh, it entailed was two parts. Uh, the first part was a paper in which I looked at Kurt Vonnegut's, uh, four of Kurt Vonnegut's novels, and really tried to dig out what kind of um, existential theme they might have. And the second part, I wrote, uh, I worked on a novella of my own in which I incorporated existential themes uh, into the writing and tried to really um, challenge and convey the ideas in my own way. Um, so the basic question I was asking with my paper was how, d or whether existentialism connects with Kurt Vonnegut's literature. And through this question, you could tackle a number of different questions, such as does, uh, how did existentialism impact literature in general? Or is existentialism still culturally relevant? And the answer, so that was, um, but the basic question was whether existentialism connected with Kurt Vonnegut's work. And the answer that I found was that Kurt Vonnegut's work could be seen as a dialogue with existentialism, where he portrayed some of uh, existential idea, some existential ideas, but he also challenged them, some of them, in interesting ways. Um, but the first question that we have to ask is, what is existentialism? And this word is kind of tossed around in our current vernacular a lot. Um, people like to say, oh, that kid has a bunch of existential angst, or maybe that movie had a real existential feeling to it, and. Um, people really like to use this word just whenever, whenever something happens to question what the meaning of life is. But there really is a lot more sustenance to existentialism than just questioning what's, what's the purpose of it all. Um, but the reason why uh, there's sometimes a lot of ambiguity and generalization over existentialism is because the variety of sources from which existentialism flows. Um, and existentialism is a movement that comes out of the late uh, 19th and early 20th century. And it comes from a number of philosophers. So the precursors to the movement were really Nietzsche and Kierkegaard. Um, Camus was one of the really literary uh, men who tackled existentialism. And then you have the main existentialist philosophers, such as Jaspers, Heidegger, and Sartre. Um, I really focus my work on Sartre because he's, in a, he's seen as the principal existentialist. He's the man who actually coined the term existentialism. Um, and there are subtle nuances between the different um, ideas of the philosophers, but the general principles uh, remain the same. Um, but I really had to focus on Sartre to, to really focus uh, and crystallize my ideas. Um, so going back to this idea of what is existentialism, well, please come in. Um, so on the topic of what is existentialism, uh, Sartre begins his discussion of what existentialism is by distinguishing essence and existence. And he says everything um, that's created has an essence and an existence. Um, take, for example, this clicker. Uh, so this clicker also has an essence and existence. What essence is is uh, the purpose or the meaning for which something is created. What existence is is the physical, the physical reality, the physical manifestation of an object. So for this clicker, the existence is this physical thing that which if I, if I knock it, 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 it sounds. Um, but the essence, the essence of it is to point and uh, go back and forth on my PowerPoint. Something like a clicker, something that's created by man, the essence of it comes first. I have to know what the clicker's gonna do before I create it, and then the existence comes second. What Sartre does is he says, let's look at man. In man, does essence come first or existence come first? And he says, existence precedes essence in man. Why is this? Um, well, Sartre was an atheist, and he believed that God didn't exist. Um, this was a pretty novel idea in, uh, that really uh, stemmed up in the 20th century. But from this idea, he says, because there is no God, um, man, men are created with no essence within themselves. That gives, other, that gives men themselves the responsibility to design their own essence. Now, even if God existed, uh, there are other existentialists who believe that God does exist. 
then, but however, it's they, they believe that it's impossible to know what God actually uh, created them for. It's impossible to know what the actual essence of man is that comes from God. Therefore, men still have to design, uh, still have the responsibility of determining their own essence, their own purpose and meaning in life. Um, so there's a couple things that stem out of this uh, of the necessity of man to determine his own essence. Um, first, there's anguish at the responsibility of having to determine your own essence. Um, there's this burden of responsibility that you feel. Um, there's also abandonment at the feeling that your essence isn't consolidated in a higher power that you can't essentially know for sure what your essence is, but something that's created. Um, but, so that's basically uh, the principal tenets of existentialism. Okay, so for my paper, I looked at the ideas of existentialism and compared them to Kurt Vonnegut's works. And the first thing that I did was I figured out the overarching stylistic theme of Kurt Vonnegut and see, see, saw how that connected with uh, existentialism. So existentialists reject the uh, a fundamental or moral or principle way of living that's set by society. Um, they say you have this freedom because you have no internal essence. That's um, and because you can create your own essence, you should do what you should do. You should do. Uh, you have the freedom to make your own cr actions and create your own essence. So. Uh, Following what society tells you to do is kind of a falsehood. Um, society tells you that there's this innate essence in you, but that's not actually true. And um, so because of this, they, re they reject traditional uh, senses of moral, traditional senses of purpose. Um, and Kierkegaard actually says, the crowd is untruth. Truth is subjectivity. So this is really reflected in Kurt Vonnegut's style because Kurt Vonnegut, first of all, he lacks a traditional moral in most of his books. Um, take, for example, Slaughterhouse-Five, which is taken as an anti-war novel. However, whenever somebody dies in the novel and when the people are massacred, uh, Kurt Vonnegut simply uh, and, uh, uh, c uh, conclude with the phrase, so it goes. In this cold, cool, um, you know, this, this cold, cold, deadpan manner, he says, so it goes. So maybe there's not really a purpose or a moral for any of, all of, any of this. Um, what Kurt Vonnegut also does with his style is that he actually um, defies traditional norms of writing. Um, for example, <clears throat> In Breakfast of Champions, he includes illustrations, hand-drawn hand illustrations that are sometimes vulgar or crude um, in order, and these really defy what is traditionally meant, seen in a book. Um, another thing that he does is he includes uh, unreliable narrators, um, <clears throat> and you can't really trust whether the narrators are telling the truth. This also subverts, uh, subverts this traditional norm of what literature is. Now moving on to what the individual books curtail and how they connect to existentialism. Um, so first I'm going to talk about religion and Cat's Cradle. Um, so Cat's Cradle is a book um, in which there are people that follow this religion called Bokanonism. And um, so Bokanonism is actually interesting because it's self-professedly false. Um, the first, one of the first verses of the book of Bokanon is, all of the true things I am about to tell you are shameless lies. <clears throat> so this is really interesting because it's this religion that stems from it being false. So I think what this book really uh, tries to do is it tackles um, Sartre's view of whether God exists. So when, when Sartre starts from this principle of that God doesn't exist, and because of that we can create our own purpose, well, I, th I think what Vonnegut is doing is raising the question, well, if we can create our own purpose based on, what, uh, based on the fact that God doesn't exist, can we go back to the idea that God is giving us purpose? If, can we give us, go back to this idea that our purpose is to follow God? You know, can we create this own God for ourselves? Um, from, from the idea that God doesn't exist. And I think that's what Cat's Cradle really does and really presents this idea through this kind of contradictory uh, religion presented within it. Um, 
Next, moving on to uh, Mother's N Mother Night. Um, Mother Night is actually interesting because despite what I said before about morals, it in, the in the beginning, in an editor's note written by Kurt Vonnegut himself, he says, the moral of this story is that, is that you be, be careful what you pretend to be. So I kind of doubted whether that was the exact moral of the story because, I mean, Kurt Vonnegut gives us a a, satir a satiricist, and he really um, likes to hide and um, dilute things. So uh, looking into the book, I really found um, it's really something that kind of questions that principle of be careful what you pretend to be. Now this is a principle existentialist um, idea, be careful what you pretend to be, because our uh, Sartre believes that our actions determine who we are. Um, say for example that you, you choose to murder somebody, or no, no, that's extreme. Say, say for example, that you choose to get married. Um, Sartre says that is you validating that uh, matrimony is one of the greatest things, uh, is, is a great thing. Um, so Sartre says, uh, so he says essentially that your actions determine who you are. Um, but the interesting thing that I found about Mother Night is that it has this character who pretends to be, or he's a Nazi spy, essentially. Or no, he, he's a spy for the Americans uh, in, in the Nazi regime. He's a propagandist in the Nazi regime who sends out uh, these, this wonderfully horrible propaganda about America and the rest of the world and freedom and everything like that. But within, within these messages are codes that um, that that say that are for the Americans. So um, so you might think that that's that's what the moral the you, be careful what you pretend to be is really about that you should pretend not to be a Nazi. But actually looking into it, I found that really this character what was authentic for him um, it was actually his love. He he loved his wife and he loved his wife dearly and he thought himself as a nation of two with his wife. So really he really found that he had no other nation. So for him what he should have done really is to have ignored the Nazis um, and to just carried on his life living with his wife. Now this presents a dilemma. This presents the dilemma of should you do what you want to do, or should you do what's right? Um, Sauter actually presents this dilemma in The Soldier's Dilemma, where there's a soldier who uh, loves his mother, but he also, he's also in, uh, at war. Uh, sh and his mother it, wants him to come back home. Should he go back to his mother, or should he go to war? Um, this is, dilemma is kind of pulled to moral extremes in this book by presenting this man who either has to uh, fight against the Nazis or just uh, stay at home with his wife. Now, what, what, what is the right uh, choice course of action here? Um, so th th this dilemma is uh, reiterated within Mother Night. Um, now moving on to the topic of free will. So Sartre and other existentialists, they kind of take free will as granted. They take um, our ability to uh, create our own actions as granted. Um, and I feel like Kurt Vonnegut, he really doesn't believe this. He's skeptical of it. Um, so in Slaughterhouse-Five, there's a character who becomes quote unquote unstuck in time and he can't control where he is in time and he's also in war so he can't control anything. And this really seems to undermine the idea that you have free will. Um, what it actually does connect to though is, the Cam uh, is Camus' idea of free will. Um, and Camus writes about in The Myth of Sisyphus. If you know who Sisyphus is, he uh, is this man uh, in Greek mythology who, pull, who pushed a rock up a hill um, continuously. He argues that even when um, his actions are set in stone, essentially. Sisyphus' actions are set in stone. He finds value in the moments in his mind, in the freedom of his mind, that he's able to you know, defy the gods in the, every time he walks down that hill. Um, so uh, there's, it, so Lauderhouse 5 connects to this Camusian idea that even if you can't control your own body, you can control your mind. However, Breakfast of Champions even undermines that idea that you can control your own mind by uh, including these portrayals of characters who are driven by the chemicals in their own brain. And this is basic uh, neurobiology that we are connected by, we are controlled by uh, electrical and chemical synapses in our mind. And Vonnegut uses this idea to un once again undermine the idea of free will. So overarchingly, you can see the connection between existential ideas and uh, Kurt Vonnegut and how Kurt Vonnegut sometimes will portray uh, and display ideas and sometimes he'll really challenge them. Um, so what I did for my novel is I actually, it was, 
it wasn't a simple novel. It was uh, it was actually in three parts. Um, the first part was. Um, about this kind of quixotic hero who believes in his purpose and he, he goes to defeat, defeat this dictator and he defeats the dictator because he's filled with hope and vigor and life and love. But however, uh, he turns out not to be a very great ruler himself and he gets killed by, uh, by a different a civilian. Um, so the second part was actually about a writer who was writing the first part, uh, if you guys follow along. Uh, yeah, he was writing the first part, and the first part was essentially a narrative that he wrote. So it's this kind of teen writer uh, who doesn't really believe in anything. Um, he thinks like Christianity is really dumb, and then uh, he essentially he goes through um, and he dies at the end in a kind of random and meaningless way. Uh, the third part goes back to the world of uh, the the first uh, the first narrative. Um, it goes back to that world, but it's a lot darker. It's a lot uh, more it's a lot uh, more gloomy, and it follows this. Um, this news anchor woman, this newswoman, who's depressed and she's suicidal. There's no real reason why she's depressed and suicidal, but she wants to kill herself. But she gets, she finds a gun and she doesn't kill herself and she lives. And there's no real reason why she lives. Um, she just decides to live randomly. Uh, actually, Camus said he asked himself uh, every day, "Should I kill myself or have a cup of coffee?" So this is kind of what I kind of portrayed through um, the third part. Uh, another quote of Camus is, he who despairs of the human condition is a coward, but he who has hope for it is a fool. Um, and if you look at the overarching narrative, I think you can kind of see how that quote is portrayed uh, through uh, the story. Um, so what I want you to do, want, want to do now is kind of have story time. And <laughs> uh, so I want to read uh, some of my story. And uh, this is actually, so the writer in the second part, he also includes some of his short stories within that, uh, within that part. So this is coming from this kind of teen, this is a short story written by this kind of existential, uh, he doesn't believe in anything kind of author. Um, so yeah, I'll just read now. Uh, Kasai Kirosaki loved to smoke a cigarette after a good fuck. He had first seen someone on one of those American movies about cowboys or gangsters do it. On the screen, the man with the chiseled jawline and mesmerizing blue eyes. The movie was in black and white, but you could tell the eyes were blue. Took long swigs of a Marlboro or camel in between sips of cognac, while the beautifully blonde dame rested on his chest. Kasai was no buff American hero. He was lanky as a grasshopper and spent most of his free time reading manga, but he sure could pretend to be. Feeling the coarse smoke swirl down his throat, he felt as if he understood the pains and loneliness of the Wild West. It was Kasai's torturously satisfying relationship with characters that brought such joy to his lips and bodies. Kasai worshipped the figurine, the character, the aspects of fantasy that gave kick to life. At anime conventions or at one of Taroshi's regular gathering of seinen and shonen lovers, Kasai regularly dressed up as the deadly master of the blade, Genkura, or the lightning-footed soldier of the west, Matsu Drift. Whether he was in a heavy black robe that drifted to the floor with a green mask of emerald, or he was donning those orange combat boots with the matching red wig, Kasai felt that he held power in these costumes. His friends would marvel at the level of detail in his ability to capture not just the physical attributes, but the emotional feeling of a character. They themselves might not be able to. They themselves might be able to fashion the every jewel and diamond in Deray Matani's uh, fantastic coat of armor, but they were never able to fully participate in the understanding of character that Kasai had with every twitch of the eyebrow or flick of the finger. His girlfriend Daki Makura rarely liked to join him on this cosplaying journeys. She was very shy. Most of the time she stayed at home all day, comfortable in their sparse apartment. Kasai didn't mind that she was so inclined to keep away from strangers. He thought it was cute. And besides, he didn't w want to work up those sexually deprived animaniacs with the beauty of a true woman. Letting the soft clouds of obscurity puff out of his mouth as he lay next to his woman, Kasai thought of how lonely he himself had been before he met Daki. He was drifting through the graphite gray streets, playing a game of kicking a soda can ahead of him before it would land somewhere out of his way, when he noticed her, staring out the door of a shop. He was sit smitten, infatuated, hopelessly in love at first sight. She had eyes that were larger than even those of Hollywood stars, luxuriously flowing hair, and a soft, tender body. Somehow, by mustering all the power of characterization within himself, and perhaps because of Docky's peculiarity, 
Kasai was able to muster the courage to hit on Daki and say sweet things to her and take her home that night. And thus Kasai's life fundamentally shifted, as if a family's picture on the TV was perennially off-center and they had finally called someone to fix it. When he told his parents about his relationship, they were shocked. They vehemently forbade Kasai to have a relationship with her and disowned him when he refused. It was of no matter to Kasai. Daki had created such incredible light into a place of darkness that those things that used to torment him were now like raindrops on, on the skin, and no amount of droplets could kill a man. Kasai stared into Daki's eyes, her eternal smile, and her tight chin. Yes, he could say confidently, it was all worth it. All those years of having his ass kicked by schoolyard thugs, the grueling humiliation of corporate ladderhood, the sickly days of staying up till 5 a.m. playing video games because he, because he had nothing better to do in his life, they had all been worth it. As Kasai lay in, lay in this cloud of sex and smoke, his new house cleaner entered the apartment. She was a petite woman who looked unfit for her labor. Kasai had entrusted her with her own key, more due to convenience's sake than any particular feeling of faith. Neither Kasai nor the housekeeper was expecting the other, as Kasai had sporadically taken the work day off whilst forgetting that Wednesdays were cleaning days. And so it was Kasai tossed the big butt of his cigarette into the ashtray and continued to enjoy his day off by having another go at it with Daki while the house cleaner changed the trash bags in the kitchen. Kasai thought he heard something, but it pended off to the children downstairs who always made too much noise. He had no time to worry about such things when Daki was waiting to be fulfilled. He was performing brilliantly when he heard the door open. The housekeeper, looking for some cleanser fluid in the bedroom pantry, her jaw hanging loose, eyes confused, shocked. Yes, Kasai stared into the housekeeper's eyes, and those eyes were filled with such astonishment and disgust that for such a moment, he saw with her eyes how there was this skinny 28-year-old man having sex with a love pillow with a girl drawn upon it. And in that moment, Daki lost her womanhood, her reality, and was lost for forever to the world hereafter. What could Kasai do? The housekeeper had defied their relationship with her eyes, her eyes that told lies to the truth of their love, her eyes filled with judgment and harsh binding light. Her eyes had taken life and... So Kasai had to take life yet in order to give life back. And so he grabbed the samurai sword lying on, his, on the top of his dresser, fully naked with his member swinging. At this, the housekeeper screamed. She turned to run away. Time was occurring slowly. With a flying leap, Kasai plunged his sword into the housekeeper's back. It was surprisingly smooth, straight through. She fell to her knees, eyed wide toward heaven, blood dribbling out her mouth. Kasai had never noticed what a pretty face she had before. Kasai threw up. He had never killed anybody before. He hoped. He prayed that Daki could forgive him. What a foolish mistake he had made allowing a stranger to enter the intimate chamber. Yes, but thank God, at least Daki was still alive. She was breathing, shaken, stirred, knocked unconscious from shock, but a type of conscious nonetheless. It was only as a mistake that he had lost sight of her vitality. Kasai took his eyes off her face and looked down at the mess he had made. How the hell was he going to clean it? God damn, he needed a cigarette. That's my story, um, and that's the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you for all listening. You've been a wonderful audience, and I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. Questions? Yes. So um, while you were writing the story, um, who were you sort of sharing it with, and, and what were some of the more sort of influential conversations that you had with people? Um, I've shared it with uh, my friends. Um, I liked to talk about it a bit with my mom, but not not like I didn't uh, exp I didn't expose everything that I'd written to my mom. But uh, I actually have a friend named uh, Jordan Necker who's working on a project, uh, who's also working on an SYP project uh, about infinite jests. Who's uh, he helped me really formulate ideas about existentialism and really uh, solidify what what it was and how I could incorporate it into my novel. Yeah. Uh, did you find, uh, one thing I find about reading philosophy versus reading fiction is philosophy is often uh, tough to read. Yeah, very. <laughs> did philosophical ideas ever come up your prose? Did you feel like you were, you were having a battle with the style you wanted to have and the ideas you're trying to get in there? Uh, what? Basically, like, one of the, there aren't that many people who can literarily, you know, kind of get these ideas. Camus and Sartre are kind of, you know, yeah. kind of it on this. So the question is, is that did you find while you were writing a novella, yeah. that the clean prose you might have been going for was getting gummed up by the philosophical ideas you're trying to put in there. 
Hmm. N not really, because I didn't, so my, my novella, it didn't really, it wasn't really about dense uh, philosophical like ideas. Um, it was more about the implications of existentialism. Um, yeah, it wasn't about it wasn't necessarily about it didn't necessarily directly tackle existential ideas, more so as tackle what happens um, when we lose sight of purpose. Um, do we do we survive in this world? Yeah. Um, well, he he was an author that I've read before, and I I enjoy his work. Um, but also, um, to me, it was pretty evident from the beginning that um, his books, you know, lacked a clear sense of moral purpose, you know, a clear structure. Um, so, uh, but really, when I delved into the books, I found some stuff that was a lot deeper in connection to existentialism. So I was really surprised myself in seeing how they connected to the books. Um, I guess I was a bit fortunate in that way. Had you read any Kafka? And did that tie into like how you came up with some of your? Yeah, I read. Um, I didn't read. Um, so I, I read. I read. Um, so I had this book, essentially, that had um, what is it? Segments of each a lot of philo uh, philo uh, existential philosophers' writings. Um, it's by Walter Kaufman, um, or it's, it's an anthology by Wal uh, collected by Walter Kaufman. Um, and this book was pretty helpful, and Kafka was included in it. Uh, yeah, I really like this part about uh, from Kafka actually, where he talks about couriers and kings, um, where he say he says. Um, Essentially, that there are a bunch of people uh, running around being couriers for kings, being messengers for kings, but these kings don't exist. So these messengers are screaming out these uh, these purposeless messages when really, perhaps they could be kings themselves. Any other question? What are some of your favorite kind of images and lines from your story, and and why? Hmm. Some favorite images and lines. Uh, I can't like completely just I, the, the exact lines. Um, I don't. I don't exactly have. Or, um, or images, or or even a theme that you know that kind of emerged at the end that you feel like yeah that that really kind of nailed what I was trying to say. So in the e so in the end of the second part, um, the. The writer, he's just on this bus bus ride, and the bus crashes, and the the author is just bleeding out, and he just says, "Well, shit, this is a perfectly meaningless way to die," and I thought I, I enjoyed that for myself. <laughs> Time for one more question. What are you doing next year? Uh, so I'll be going to Johns Hopkins. Uh, I'm. What am I doing? Uh, well, I'll be I'll be at college. Thank you. Any idea what you're going to study? Uh, I'm thinking about uh, studying international relations and maybe English. Did you ever consider the, the So It Goes refrain as a spiritual mantra, not just a the, nihilistic mantra? Uh, could, could you, who's Sardis? No, uh, oh, so, oh, oh, oh. No, that whole So It Goes mantra. Oh, OK, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, so I think there, there are different ways to interpret it, yeah. Um, the way I chose to interpret it was like nihilistic. I guess, yeah. I mean, definitely, you can take it that way, where um, it's something that that relieves them of their passing. But um, I mean, I agree with your reading, but I, I've always kind of I always like to play with my head whether that. Oh. Yeah, I think I think like I mean to be perfectly honest, I think there is some weight when he says so it goes. I don't think he's just being like, oh, those people died, like whatever. But like, yeah, I think there's the weight in the repetition, right? Yeah. It's like, but, so the weight kind of comes from him repeating it over and over, so to like kind of show the number of casualties and the number of lives that are like kind of lost in our world. Kind of related to um, Bill Belichick, it is what it is. You must say that. Like, <laughs> <laughs>
Never thought of magic as a spiritual guy. You were the concept as a spiritual guy. But I can relate it to it. That's right. You're a nihilist. Right.